Good morning, everyone. One of the greatest challenges of this pandemic has been that it's a brand new virus, one never before seen in humans. So the entire world has had to learn as we go. But one thing that's been clear from the beginning is most dangerous to those over the age of 65 with chronic conditions. Protecting our seniors, our parents, grandparents, and neighbors has been a high priority from the start, which is why one of the very first measures we took was the difficult decision of closing our long-term care facilities and other senior care homes to visitors. But this was critical to limiting deadly outbreaks in these facilities. And sadly, in a few cases, we saw how devastating this could be. So while we know these steps were necessary and strict precautions remain essential, there's also an emotional and social price paid by these residents and their families. So my team, including the Agency of Human Services, Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, and the Department of Health, have been working to find ways to ease some of these restrictions to allow for much needed social and family connections that are also critical to the health of our seniors. Through this careful work, they developed a phase in approach for these facilities. And with our trends continuing to move in the right direction, we can announce the first step forward today. Secretary Smith will share details of this plan, as well as hospital visitation in a few minutes. But in summary, beginning Monday, we allow outdoor visitation with two guests. Now, I realize this step is small, but it's meaningful. And we'll continue to keep the health and safety of these Vermonters a top priority. Like everything else, we'll be tracking any changing or concerning trends. And over the weeks to come, we'll slowly increase visitors and group activities in a way that keeps everyone safe. For those over the age of 65 who don't live in a group facility, there's some changes for you as well. And Secretary Smith will also offer guidance on that front too. Again, in a pandemic with no playbook and so many challenges, this one stands out among the most difficult to solve. There's no doubt this population remains at risk for the most harmful effects of this virus. But we also know there are impacts to physical and mental health that come with a lack of connection to families and others. That's why we've been so cautious. But please know, we understand how difficult this has been, which is why we are taking these steps today. I also want to take a moment to thank all those who work in these senior care facilities for working tirelessly to keep your extended family safe. I know you've been working long hours and worried about your own health as well as the health of your family, but I also know you've been going above and beyond to give a little extra care and attention to our seniors while their loved ones have been restricted from visiting. You made a huge difference for them as well as the entire state, so I thank you for that. Now for details on these new visitation policies, policies I'll turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. Um, throughout this pandemic, Vermonters have sacrificed many aspects of everyday life to keep us safe. Older Vermonters have been especially impacted. They have been asked to stay home to protect themselves and others. For those who are living in long-term care residential facilities, they have been without visitors since mid-March because they are a very vulnerable population during this pandemic. The decision to shut down visitation was the right one. Different set of challenges. Um, we'll be looking at those in the weeks ahead. But I will say that um, last night uh, we had a new positive inmate case that was detected at Marble Valley Regional uh, Correctional Facility in Rutland. This was a new intake who came back from Florida on an extradition order. They were symptomatic upon arrival. 
DOC's policies uh, kept him from having any contact with the general population. He was quarantined. We have a quarantine policy for new inmates that are coming in. He is still quarantined in a negative pressure cell. Uh, contact tracing is underway. Um, that will continue, this will continue to coordinate with the Department of Health. And depending on the uh, tracing, we'll determine whether testing, in, uh, whether what kind of testing is involved, including facility-wide testing. Uh, but staff who transported the inmate will be tested and Marble Valley has been designated as a COVID positive facility. This comes one week uh, after the state completed testing of all inmates uh, and staff at Vermont's uh, six correctional facilities. Uh, the, the, we, this is, just as an aside, this will probably be an ongoing issue that we have to deal with and we're going to set in the quarantine for Sam why we set the quarantine procedures into place because uh, as the greatest danger right now at the correctional facilities is from the outside not from the inside that is why the quarantine protocols are in place and the DOC has to be recognized at least in my it, 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 from from my perspective on how quickly they act in uh, these sort of cases and move from uh, and move on these cases when they discover them again um, this was an intake uh, that has tested positive and ha is quarantined and has been quarantined since uh, returning from Florida I'll now turn over to the podium to Dr. Levine, who will um, talk about those, um, those Vermonters 65 plus and some of the precautions they should be taking. Thank you. I do want to pick up on that theme of combating social isolation. So the theme is physically distance, but socially keep connected. Before I get to the over 65, I just want to go over three quick slides as an update on the state and on the uh, outbreak. So here's our total cases, which have not changed in a day or two, and our deaths, which continue to not change. When we look at this, I only care about in this slide and the next one, looking at the visual. The numbers don't matter. If you look, this has been our slope all along for a long time. It went up with the outbreak. You'll now see we've reassumed the same slope we were on previously. And then here, obviously we had a spike in cases at the time of the outbreak that has persisted. And now <clears throat> we're in a very low phase, in fact, um, if you look at the last four days of data, there have been no additional uh, cases associated with the outbreak. So I don't really have a lot to tell you about um, with regard to um, anything new because cases have not changed. We're continuing to follow those who have been contact traced. In the pool of those contact traced, 13 went on to become cases. There's really no change in the distribution of adults to kids, 60% to 40% approximately. Still no hospitalizations and no deaths. And um, people ask me every minute, not every day, is it boxed in? Is it over? Can we move on? And while I would like to speak with the utmost of confidence, I have to caution everyone that this virus has a 14-day incubation period. So from a very technical standpoint, uh, we allow two incubation periods to go by before we call something over. However, right now we would settle for just one incubation period just to further solidify the fact that it is boxed in and contained and uh, we're not getting increases in cases. But with four days, that is impossible to say uh, from a scientific standpoint, if you will. So 
moving on to um, over 65. So obviously uh, the theme here is we're continuing to restart and reopen Vermont and reconnect. Connecting with families, connecting with friends. And it is not an uncommon question in our state for people to ask us at the health department, look, I'm over 65, what does this mean for me? And everybody is appropriately still concerned about COVID, not wanting to contract it, and knowing that the more severe cases occur in those who are older. But again, to be older doesn't necessarily imply you are in poor health. It only states that age is a risk factor. We know that our immune response becomes weaker as we age. In addition, often by age 65, people have begun to accumulate some chronic diseases. They may be uh, less they may be more immunocompromised because of some of those diseases. So we have to realize if a person considers themselves vulnerable, they're probably accurate. They may not be uh, super vulnerable, but just age alone does make you more vulnerable. But even the CDC does acknowledge that you can begin to restart yourself, if you will. We've talked previously on Fridays usually about CDC phases. And there's phase one, phase two, phase three, and we're entering phase three here in Vermont, which is low controlled transmission. It's the best you can do in the three phases. In phase one and phase two, the guidelines say for the vulnerable, shelter in place. In phase three, it now says practice social distancing or physical distancing. We all want to connect with others. We know that social isolation can lead to poorer health. So we want to help people be armed with information and make wise choices on their own and measure and manage the risks versus the benefits. So point number one, be aware of your surroundings. Obviously choose outdoor settings more than indoor settings. One thing we've learned about the virus is that in a closed space, there is aerosolized, vir aerosolized virus produced by simple acts like talking and laughing, never mind by coughing or sneezing, even by singing and shouting. And those aerosolized drops, unlike the larger droplets, can hang out in the air for a bit of time, sometimes for hours. Clearly in an outdoor setting, that's much less meaningful than being confined in a room. So it's best if you're in a room to make those contacts briefer than they would be outdoors. This will become even more important in the fall and the winter, when of course we begin to move activities into the indoor settings. When indoors, pay attention to the size of the space that you're in, how much crowding there may be, how many people are there? Are the people there actually doing things to prevent you from getting COVID? Are they wearing facial coverings? Are they actually keeping a distance? As we know, with this virus, the actions of those around us make a critical difference. So you have to ask yourself, are you comfortable in this setting? And so much of what I'm going to say is science-based, but it's common sense. Next point, choose activities that don't require close contact. So minimize close contacts while talking or doing anything that requires exertion, shouting, singing, things of that sort. Everybody knows this weekend is Father's Day. So yes, this will be a great time to visit with your grandchildren. But being COVID aware, make sure you keep your distance. But just being in the same location with them, even if you're not hugging them, is a lot different than staying at home and not actually having the opportunity to see them up front. Keep your social circle small. That again gets down to that concept of uh, trusted households. So choose a few other trusted households 
that are also taking health and safety precautions. And then lastly, what about traveling? If you're considering traveling beyond our state to visit friends or family, most authorities are saying maybe you want to think twice about it. And knowing what our data in Vermont looks like, and the data we show every Friday, uh, clearly there are preferred locations and less preferred locations that you'd want to travel to. We're seeing enough viral spread around the country, and some of it within driving range of Vermont, to conclude that traveling does still present a significant added risk. If you want to get very scientific and considering travel, Think about all the things that we talk about on Fridays in terms of what is the data for active cases in that location? What is the trend in that location? Increasing cases, down, down sloping cases. What is the syndromic surveillance data? Are a lot of people reporting COVID-like symptoms? Um, we give you, up, give you that freely on our own uh, informative sessions here and on our website. Uh, you should be able to find the same in many other states. So we're all looking forward to a time when COVID is not a primary concern. A time has not yet come. We all know that we're in this for the long run with COVID until we have the right treatments and vaccines. So we have to continue to be cautious. Staying home is probably too cautious for most who are over 65. They can begin to get out, as I've said. Uh, but at the same time, staying close to home may be the safest. Thank you. With that, we'll open up to questions. Alvin? Uh, thank you. So, Governor, earlier this week, um, the Chamber of Commerce, Businesses for Social Responsibility, uh, Main Street, Vermont, they sent a letter to the Pro Tem and to the Speaker um, asking them to release the full $200 million uh, for business stimulus money. Um, I wish, or I, I wonder if you could just comment on the mounting concerns from all across the business community about getting this money out the door. Yeah, we, we've been hearing for quite some time over the last few weeks uh, about the growing concern they have over the economy and just trying to survive, uh, which is why we wanted to expedite this. Um, it was a total of, as you recall, $400 million, uh, two phases, $310 million in the first phase, $90 million in the second phase, uh, and trying to get this money out just as quick as possible. As I talked about last week, trying to encourage uh, the legislature to move forward on this. And we're appreciative uh, of them taking this first step, but it was really, in some respects, only $70 million out of the $300 uh, that we requested. Now, it can be done in phases. Uh, we're willing to work with them on this, uh, but really uh, getting this money out the door is critical to the survival of many, many businesses throughout Vermont. And, and it's part of the crumbling nature of our economic foundation uh, that I'm so concerned about because the ripple effect of this over the next uh, six months, over the next 12 months, uh, and beyond that in years is, uh, is essential uh, that we fix it now. Uh, and trying to make this investment in those businesses that are just really fragile right now because the jobs come along with it. It's not just the businesses, it's about the jobs, the people associated uh, that, are, that are employed by these businesses because if they don't survive, then we have this systemic unemployment gap uh, that we'll see in the future and, and leading to a lot of other issues uh, in, in, in terms of our societal issues over the next couple of years. And uh, the legislature's plan is working its way through appropriations this week. Uh, it's, it won't make it to your desk. Um, do you plan to sign it as well? Yeah, we haven't seen. Uh, there was a, the initial uh, package they passed last week, S350. Um, that was the uh, 70 million plus 23 million they had uh, added for uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Uh, so it was a total of 93 million out of the 300. Um, but we haven't, uh, haven't seen that yet, uh, hasn't made it uh, over to us uh, to, to take a look at. I, I would anticipate that we would, that I would sign it. 
uh, based on what I know about it, but we haven't seen any of the details and we haven't seen it. Along with the elections law bill, uh, that hasn't arrived yet either. week uh, because we're getting more and more calls from the hospitality industry in its entirety uh, not just restaurants but hotels and B&Bs and so forth uh, that are, that are in trouble and uh, so what we need to do is just to focus on this um, get beyond the political rhetoric and let's just focus on how do we help these entities these businesses this sector and the, again, the people, the jobs that go along with it, uh, because it's critical that we face this and, and really uh, get the money out the door just as quick as possible uh, so that we can shore up this uh, economic foundation that I said, as I said before, is crumbling and fractured. And just a quick follow-up, earlier this week we saw in New York as many as 25,000 complaints against bars, restaurants, places like that for not following state issue guidelines. Has the state of Vermont seen Um, I, I'm sure there have been complaints. I'm not aware of them individually. Uh, maybe Commissioner Sherling or Secretary Curley uh, may be on the line and could uh, briefly talk to us about that, but I'm not personally aware of, uh, of uh, the magnitude of, of those complaints. Commissioner Sherling or Secretary Curley? Yes, sir, I am on the line, but I couldn't hear the entire question. It was just about... Uh, in terms of New York, it's seen uh, 25,000 complaints over the last week uh, in, in terms of some of the businesses not adhering to guidelines and wondering whether Vermont has seen uh, an uptick in the number of complaints. Uh, we have not that I'm aware of, and I think the total number of complaints we've seen numbers in the low hundreds uh, since March. Thank you. Yeah, this is Secretary Curley, just to follow up. We're, you know, same thing. We get um, some tips here and there where folks uh, suggest that maybe there's um, some non-compliance, but with each situation, we've been able to provide some education and uh, folks are more than willing to comply. So, Governor, a couple of things. Uh, number one, a clarification on the uh, policy for the nursing homes. Um, you had said that you're going to put it in place effective for Monday. I think Mike was saying he's going to try to get that yeah. going for the weekend. So I think, just, yeah, you know. technically uh, we were striving for Monday, uh, knowing that that's maybe how long it would take. Uh, but obviously with Father's Day being Sunday, I think what they're trying to do is uh, get it in place before then, which would be great news for all of us. So I look forward to that, um, and, and I'm sure they'll attain it. If they have that goal, uh, we'll be able to do that. But I was uh, just trying to be on the safe side. Uh, and as far as uh, it's kind of on the political side, uh, we're talking about that money, and uh, you had expressed what you expressed last week. Uh, the legislature must be feeling a little bit of pressure there because uh, this morning on a talk show, uh, the Speaker of the House was, uh, was the guest, and she was kind of pushing it back into your court, saying it took two months from the time that the, money, the check got here in the state before you brought your plan forward, and we're trying to push out what we can, when we can, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess we're playing tests. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to rise above that. Uh, obviously, uh, when it passed, uh, Congress passed it, and by the time they got guidance to us, it was weeks later. Uh, so I would, I would say we probably had uh, four weeks uh, to do our work, depending on the guidance that came forward. But again, I want to rise above that. We should, uh, you know, utilize our energy uh, and uh, and focus on on the virus itself and combating that, 
uh, as well as uh, fighting uh, this economic challenge uh, that we have together. So um, if they want to prove me wrong in, in some respects, uh, they should just pass some bills and get the money rolling, and that would prove me prove me wrong. So I'm fully uh, willing uh, to accept that. If, if they can get that done, I'd be more than happy. Uh, the, the other excuse that, well, the other uh, point that she was making was that during your work on the bill, on the, the administration's work on, uh, on the plan, that uh, they didn't have any sort of representation to have some input to maybe make it a little bit easier once it got to them. Yeah. Well, we've included legislators on this as well, so many of them were fully aware of this. But again, let's just focus on getting it done. Uh, let's get the money out the door. Let's get it in the hands of, of those who are going to provide the jobs and opportunities and, and trying to uh, survive uh, during this and then thrive later. Because the, the healthier we are uh, and the, the healthier we can keep uh, those businesses, those entities, those jobs now, uh, the better off we're going to be six months from, from now, one year from now, two years from now. What we do today is critical uh, to the future. Moving to the phones, Wilson, the AP. Um, hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, what do you, there is no exact answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> we're, hearing, we're hearing all this, relatively speaking, good news here. Uh, the numbers are down. You know, this is about the virus itself, not the, not the response. So how long do you think that the state and uh, in, in its entirety in the health department and all of you will be on this, and I wish I could come up with a better way of saying this, but on the war footing you are now as you respond to it. Now, do you anticipate that easing off as time goes on here? And, yeah, I certainly... Know, how, how does that stop? Yeah, I certainly okay. hope so, uh, Wilson. Uh, nothing would make me happier uh, than to get to a point where we didn't have the state of emergency, where we didn't have to have uh, this unwinding, where we were going back to somewhat uh, normalcy. And I, you know, every day uh, we get closer to that. When I, when I'm seeing the numbers, and I, I think I've described uh, every morning. I go uh, and write on a piece of paper um, what the positivity rates are in other states surrounding us, what the death rates are, uh, number of people tested, and so forth. And I keep track of things like that in comparison to where we were even a week ago, two weeks ago, is incredible. Uh, the numbers are coming down drastically in uh, New York. Uh, and uh, as well as in uh, Boston and uh, in the Boston area in Massachusetts in general and that's good news uh, for us uh, because New Jersey will follow, Connecticut will follow, Rhode Island will follow and pretty soon we'll be able to open up all of the Northeast which is essential uh, to us in terms of tourism uh, and that's again why it's so essential uh, where we're you know, we can see light at the end of the tunnel. We can see where we're going to be able to have more people coming to visit our state uh, in a safe way. Uh, but we have to, uh, again, from an economic standpoint, we have to make sure that we have businesses here that, that have been able to survive this. Uh, and so that's why it's essential that we get this money out the door and into the hands of those just to hold on just a little bit longer. Because help is on the way, and the help is having more business, more tourism, and so forth in a safe manner. But it's, uh, it's good news in, in a lot of respects across the Northeast, which is, again, essential to us uh, because we count on uh, tourism. Uh, and the hospitality sector uh, counts on that as well. Um, OK, thank you very much. Mike Donahue, The Islander. I was wondering uh, if there's an update uh, about implementing screening or mandatory masks for the general public down to the Bloomer's State Office Building at Rutland for those people that are passing through. Uh, and I'm just wondering what are the personal screening levels at every other state office building across Vermont? Was the Bloomer Building the only one where no monitoring was undertaken? And are there other state employees and members of the public in jeopardy going into other state facilities in other counties because there's no screening or monitoring? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, Secretary Kirk, um, Young, uh, Secretary Young, are you on the line? Uh, I think we had 
a little bit of discussion about this very subject over the last couple of days. Do you have anything to offer on this? Uh, thank you, Governor. Yes, Mike. You know, in general, Mike, the um, state office buildings uh, do have the screening uh, questions um, at the entrances. Uh, and so anybody who's entering the building is expected to, um, to pre-screen themselves. We also um, have uh, facial mask uh, um, signs that say that they are encouraged by the visiting public, but we also have some direct contact services within mostly our agencies of human services and now our Department of Motor Vehicles where the public are asked to wear uh, facial masks when interacting or having some direct contact, contact that is not physically distant with state employees to wear masks. We, we supply masks to the public, and they do not have one available. The Asa Bloomer building is um, an interesting building. It's one we recently acquired as a state, and it is, um, does have public uh, businesses within the building and off of the lobby that is uh, used as a travel corridor from the transit center. I'd ask the Department of Buildings and General Services to take a look at that um, travel area to determine whether there is a way to divert traffic um, around the building uh, instead of through the building. So we're, we're looking at that. But in terms of um, visitors to state offices who require services and require direct contact, we are uh, providing them with face, facial coverings uh, for those appointments. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Cat WCAX. Cat WCAX. Hi, sorry about that. I'm looking at this long term care guidance memo and it's dated June 12th. That's last Friday. Why are we just hearing about this now? I mean, families have been waiting to ans for answers to this since mid-March, so why keep them waiting longer if this guidance was issued five days ago? I, I'm not sure that the guidance was issued five days ago. We may have um, been putting it into place uh, since then, but uh, I'll let Secretary Smith answer that. Kat, I'm presuming you're looking at a draft memo that we were sending out to the to the community to the uh, long-term care uh, community, looking for uh, some sort of uh, feedback on that. The it, the guidance that we're going to be issued is going to be effective June 9th, 19th. Uh, as you know, we go through a fairly extensive process when we go through these various uh, guidelines. As I mentioned, we we connected with the long-term care um, community out there and getting the feedback. We had Dale, we had the um, Department of Health involved. And uh, just just to go on, when you're looking at hospital visitation, we talked to emergency, do emergency room docs as well as the Vermont Hospital Association. So what you're looking at is probably a draft because the, the current guidelines are, and are not effective until they were supposed to be Monday um, and I this is my fault I forgot um, to, to uh, mention it to the governor we're trying to bring those up until for effective the 19th for Father's Day okay this is the link that was sent out this morning by the um, governor's team so it is dated June 12th, so on the actual memo that I'm reading. Um, in any case, moving on from that, we know facilities that are already having visitors and already making plans to have residents do things like dining or activities together. Um, so are they not in compliance and who's enforcing compliance? Yeah, they, they are not in compliance if they are congregate dining uh, together. Um, this is different than other areas because this is a regulated industry and we will, um, uh, we will, uh, if somebody reports it, we will investigate um, whether they're in compliance with the regulations. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, just, I guess, a few follow up questions this morning. Um, I, I think the first for you, Governor, you said uh, last week, I think to a 
question from Mike Donahue. Uh, quote, I fear my racing days are over. Did you mean just for this year or for good? No, no. Um, yeah, let me clarify that. Uh, until the state of emergency is over, uh, or, and that's not just a piece of paper, it's whether, you know, are we at a point where we can go back to some sort of normal? Um, I can't uh, foresee racing when um, I have a lot on my plate, as you might expect, uh, between uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, as well as the uh, budgetary issues, uh, as well as the economic issues and so forth. Um, just a lot going on, so I don't want to divert any attention to anything else but that. And, and for me, it's every day uh, and every night. And I, I work uh, diligently on this. I take this responsibility uh, and put it uh, squarely on my shoulders uh, and take it seriously. So uh, I, can't, uh, I can't do that and, and do other things as well. So hopefully uh, we'll get back again uh, to where I can uh, go back up and race at some point, uh, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, this job comes first. All right, it seems like the, the citizens of Vermont might cut you a little slack on that, but uh, anyway, I'll move on. Uh, this may be for Commissioner Harrington. Do, do we know an update on uh, USGIS uh, job cuts, and are there any other government sector jobs that you're aware of uh, that may be seeing some cuts in the near future? Uh, yeah, hello. Um, Michael Harrington, Commissioner of Department of Labor. Um, we did have a conversation with USCIS. Uh, I think it's been reported um, both in Vermont and across the country that they're expecting um, uh, furloughs for a large portion of the entire uh, USCIS staff nationally. Um, in our conversation, uh, the local team out of the Vermont office did not have numbers yet or an idea of how broad that scope would be and what the impact would be here in Vermont. Um, we are setting up a, an interagency team to work with them um, so that when they become aware of what that impact is going to be, um, that we can help assist in getting information out to impacted employees. Um, but they themselves did not know locally what that, um, how, how broad a scope um, the potential furloughs would be. Um, so from that perspective, we do expect that there will be impacted um, staff here in Vermont, employees, um, and at this time we don't know uh, exactly what that looks like as of yet. And to answer your other question about other um, governmental agencies, federal, uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. And uh, last quick question here. Uh, I understand AOT spent $3.9 million from the COVID relief fund money uh, just in the last two weeks or so, uh, but I couldn't really find online what that was spent on. Can you fill that in, Governor? Yeah, I'm not aware of, um, of what they spent that on the last two weeks. Um, over the last three months, uh, there's been a, a number of areas, whether it's been assisting the Labor Department uh, in terms of uh, unemployment and putting uh, people there on the phones, uh, as well as uh, you, you know, counting uh, vehicles coming into the state. Uh, I'm just not sure of, of what, uh, what that was spent on, but we certainly can, uh, I can have Secretary Flynn uh, get back to you and uh, give you some details. Hi, okay. Governor, this is uh, Secretary Young. I could just provide a little more there. Sure. Um, the 3.9 million, as you mentioned, I believe is since the beginning of the state of emergency and the work that they have done uh, responding to the, the pandemic in many ways. The process is such that um, they put their request in against the coronavirus relief money uh, in one document. So the $3.9 million is one document representing all of their um, extensive I would assume to date. In, okay. Was uh, that in total, uh, Secretary uh, Young, was that in total with uh, FEMA dollars as well, or is it just with uh, uh, the CARES Act? No, Governor, that, yeah, there was, there is additional, um, there are additional expenses incurred by uh, VTRANS that will be put into FEMA for reimbursement uh, with a FEMA application. I am guessing at this point, but my memory is the total is five to six million. Uh, Greg, we can uh, I can have uh, Secretary Flynn reach out to you. 
Okay, appreciate it. Thank you, Governor. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello, I think this is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, Still there, Joe? I could answer that one, Joe. <laughs> yeah. You still there, Joe? Maybe you could try calling back in. All right, Joe, we'll come back to you at the end. Yes? Oh, oh, there go you ahead. go. Okay. Uh, um, I've seen that the American Red Cross is um, telling potential donors that they are going to do serology screening uh, on all donations and inform donors of their um, th whether they have antibodies in, in their blood or not. And given what you said both about the uh, likelihood of false negatives and positives and also the small percentage of people you expect to see with antibodies. Is, is there a real purpose to this? And um, is there any chance of the data being useful in tracking the virus in ways that we haven't been able to do before? That's a great question. Uh, I'm going to hedge on it a little because I don't represent the Red Cross, nor do I know all about their intentions. Oh, I've heard of what you said, that they are going to be doing that. Uh, I don't know if that's every state uh, nationwide or, or not, but let's presume it was and it involved Vermont. Um, part of the motivation for that, I might add, is that the Red Cross is in serious trouble right now in terms of trying to maintain the amount of blood donations that it would traditionally want to see uh, for blood banks. Um, because in this COVID era, people have not been coming out to do such activities like donating blood. So perhaps this is a bit of an um, incentive, if you will, as well. But forgetting about the motivation, uh, to really answer your question, I'd want to know what test platform they're using to, to actually do the test, because as I alluded to on uh, Monday, there, there are preferred platforms that have better test characteristics and accuracy. Number two, I want to know how they're communicating the result to the donor, uh, because just from what you said, you appreciate the fact that in a low prevalence setting, uh, a positive result may mean something different than it would mean in a high prevalence setting. And if it's a negative result, also considerations given to is it a true negative or a false negative result. Um, but I'd like to know those things and I certainly would not mind seeing what kind of data they get um, to reflect on uh, the prevalence in a somewhat random population of Vermonters now, this population would be a bit skewed because they're selected, there's a selection bias because they're people who are donating blood. They may have certain characteristics about them that make them more health conscious, make them more COVID aversive in their behaviors, etc. But still, it would be a, an interesting data point to look at for sure that we would want to scrutinize. I would, uh, just to add to your question, in New York City, um, it's believed that one in five New York City residents might test positive on antibody testing, and they've done many thousands to, to check that out. That's way more than most places in the United States. And we all know what New York City is just coming out of, thank goodness. But uh, most of the United States, it would be well under 10%. And in many locations like Vermont, it would be well under 5%, I presume. So this would be interesting information, and we would have to just use it advisedly. Um, I, I know at one point there was some suggestion 
that uh, plasma from uh, donors, you know, for people who have had, I assume, serious cases uh, of COVID might be useful in the treatment of others. Uh, is there any indication that that actually is the case? And might that be another reason for the Red Cross screening? Yeah, so good question. The um, literature on use of antibody-rich plasma for treatment of viral infections has its uh, ups and downs, so to speak, across many viruses. There's been some recent material published in the Journal of the American Medical Association regarding uh, COVID uh, from foreign countries and uh, did not turn out to be as promising as would have been liked, but there were lots of special things about the population they looked at and the way the study was done to make that not the final word on this. Um, so it's an evolving science. Uh, could be part of the Red Cross's motivation for sure, um, but it's really a little bit unclear. But we're certainly interested in that, so if a person wanted to know their antibody status and ahead of time knew they could contribute their plasma as part of a study that would help determine if seriously ill COVID patients could benefit from plasma infusions, uh, I think that would be a very valid uh, approach to be taken. Thank you very much. Chris Mays, Brattleboro Reformer. Good morning. I'm, I was just wondering if you could tell us uh, the number, uh, if you have it, the number of uh, of the long-term facilities that will be affected by the decision, um, the, the, the new policy on visitation, and uh, if you have an approximate number of um, of uh, residents at those facilities. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll go to the phone. I think uh, Commissioner Hutt, Monica Hutt, are you on? And can you give us that information? Yes, Governor, thank you. I am on the line. It's about 204 long-term care facilities. So that includes all of our nursing homes, our residential care, assisted living residences. There are different variations of long-term care, but we are including all of them in the guidance. Um, I can't give you actual numbers, but it's between three and 4,000 Vermonters that are residences, residents of those facilities across the state. All right, and, and can someone also tell me if, um, up to this point in time is um, how many deaths have been linked to, to such facilities? Um, Commissioner Levine, I don't know if you have that off the top of your head. Yeah, Out of the 55 deaths, I can't give you the precise number, but we have it as part of a, a series we published on our website. But it's in the 50% range, give or take 5% either way. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Ian Wallace Allen, BT Digger. Hi, um, Governor, you mentioned a few weeks ago that you were going to talk to the, uh, or hear from the retailers from a survey they did about uh, whether they thought the state should mandate mask wearing. And I know that there is still a debate raging, at least on social media, about whether people should be wearing masks and whether they should have to wear masks. And I was wondering if you expect at any time to make any sort of determination on this, on whether the state would mandate masks for example, in stores. Yeah, I think, uh, Anne, uh, what I had said was, uh, before we take another turn of the spigot, whether if we increase uh, the numbers, which we anticipate doing in the not too distant future, uh, that we would be reaching out uh, to the grocers and retailers uh, for them to do some polling amongst their members to see uh, whether they thought it was necessary or not. Uh, but I have not, I personally have not reached out to them of late I know that they uh, did some uh, polling, uh, but I'd like to get some up-to-date polling uh, before we do that. 
but again, before we make any uh, other decisions about increasing the percentage of, of people uh, allowed into these retail establishments, uh, we'll be doing that. You will be uh, asking the retailers to do more polling? Yeah, I would like to get uh, to, to determine. That's what I uh, probably didn't communicate as well as I should have. Uh, but before, again, before we turn the spigot another turn, uh, opening up uh, more retail uh, to probably 50%, um, I wanted to get, uh, you know, an on-the-ground uh, response uh, to whether we should, we shouldn't, uh, and, and get their input uh, and to have them pull their members. Uh, so I think they did it early. Uh, I'd like to have it done, uh, you know, in real time as we move closer. Have you heard from any of your constituents on this issue, particularly uh, retailers or uh, anyway? Yeah, yeah, I think we get uh, responses on both sides uh, of this, as you might imagine. It is controversial. All right, thanks very much. Courtney, seven days. Hi, Governor, can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, kind of, uh, uh, Jumping off of this question of uh, Ann Walt's question, I'm curious about if you've considered um, any expansions of crowd sizes. Uh, you know, in the summer, people like to gather. There's uh, probably a lot of folks that have weddings planned. Um, and I'm just curious if you've thought about increasing that maximum crowd size or how you might determine whether it's safe to do that. Yes, um, that's an ongoing uh, discussion that we're having uh, internally. Uh, we anticipate that we will be increasing uh, the number uh, and probably around the same time that we open everything else up as well to that 50% um, uh, threshold. And uh, because we know uh, that those who are planning weddings or wanting to have their weddings and so forth uh, count on, on this. So we will be, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming uh, in the next week or two, we'll be announcing some sort of a increase in capacity or sizing of those outdoor gatherings. Okay, so it's essentially safe to say that the 25 person gathering is not expected to last for the entire summer. That's correct. Um, if we continue to see we're moving in the right direction, so I would anticipate that that will be increased in the not too distant future. Okay, great, thank you. Avery, WCAX. Hello, Governor Scott, has there been any discussion about what will happen when Amtrak returns to Vermont? Is it travel typically to a lot of um, hotspots, D.C., New York, and what is the discussion among state leaders and Amtrak around that? You know, I have not personally had any discussions about Amtrak, although uh, I've thought about that and I was going to reach out to our Secretary of Transportation to see what they're hearing, but I, I don't uh, I don't know what the expectations are, and uh, but I can get back to you on that or have him get back to you on that. I just haven't heard uh, when they intend to open that back up, and I do have concerns uh, at this point in time in traveling from you know those those hot spots like uh, New York City, and what that could mean as we bring people into uh, into Vermont. So. Uh, that's the challenge we face, uh, again, as we see more and more good news in terms of the numbers and so forth and, the, and, and what we're looking at in terms of opening up different counties throughout the Northeast. Uh, hopefully, we'll get there uh, and we'll be able to open up those counties before Amtrak makes any uh, sudden and big moves. Thank you. Liam, VPR. Hi, um, I was wondering with the, the sort of easing up and opening of visitation at long-term care facilities, um, what sort of planning and preparation has been done around responding to potential new infections that might crop up or kind of preventing them from happening? Because, you know, as, as we've sort of talked about already, uh, you know, 51% of the deaths in Vermont were at long-term care facilities and a lot of those were at two facilities. and. You know, we've seen some really great reporting about how quickly those outbreaks spread and how quickly sort of things became overwhelmed at, at those facilities. And so 
have you been taking lessons from what's happened and tried to codify any specific uh, guidance to these facilities to try to prevent that from happening again as you reopen uh, the facilities? Yeah, great question, Liam, and it's something that is a priority for us uh, to make sure that we're doing it in a safe manner, and I'll let Dr. Commissioner Levine uh, talk about that. Thanks for the question, Liam. The, um, the success we've had across the state with nursing homes uh, is really quite impressive. I know we tend to dwell on the um, unfortunate circumstances of the two nursing homes, uh, which was very early on in the uh, COVID experience, if you will. But the reality is, as uh, Commissioner Hutt refer to, there were many, many facilities, and many thousands of providers uh, who have done very well. So some of the lessons learned and one of the most aggressive policies we've implemented has to do with new admissions. You heard Secretary Smith talk about a new admission to a correctional facility earlier, who fortunately was identified essentially at the time of arrival and was appropriately quarantined. Same logic and the same procedures and policies go across all of our facilities in the state now. We basically, if you're coming from a hospital to a rehabilitation facility or a nursing home facility, uh, you have a test before you leave the hospital. Whether you know the result of the test or not, you actually get quarantined upon arrival at the facility because we know that that's such a potent way of introducing an infection into a uh, vulnerable population. So <clears throat> having just that part of the policy in place is critical. We've combined that with an even more aggressive testing policy of the individual who's the new admission over a period of time with uh, instructions about the caregivers and making sure that they're um, not in the common flow of the entire uh, facility. And if there is any uh, outbreak in a facility, uh, we don't just test the whole facility, we test the whole facility on a sequential schedule over a 10 to 14 day period. Uh, again, enabling us to cohort patients and cohort staff in appropriate ways so that a limited infection in a facility won't become a widespread outbreak in that facility. So all of that is ongoing and happening as we speak. We are also working, as uh, the Secretary uh, implied earlier, on other policies regarding long-term care, which will help them open up their facilities a little more in terms of the things that they might desire to do with visitations or with uh, people in uh, congregate settings in those facilities. And that will involve uh, a more aggressive maintenance, if you will, routine testing regime for both the staff and the residents uh, at specified intervals. Um, does that answer your question well enough? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and so it sounds like at some point you're going to be rolling out more testing or more routine testing for inpatients and people at the facility. That sounds like to me like the, the most new thing of this? The other things you described were ones that were already in place, is that correct? Uh, not back in March, but certainly uh, we've, we've been sort of innovators on the uh, testing on admission and quarantining on admission, and we've partnered with CDC um, just in the last maybe month to five or weeks or so on that, so that's fairly new. Great, thank you. Um, and Governor, uh, just a quick question for you. Um, Mayor Weinberger in Burlington this week is expected to uh, declare racism a public health emergency. Have you considered a statewide declaration similar to that? I have not. Is that something you think you might do? Um, at this point in time, I think we're, um, we are, I think, dealing with this in real time. Uh, we're dealing with it appropriately. Uh, and we could consider something in the future, but at th this point in time, we're focusing on, on what we've been doing uh, and uh, seeing that through. Thank you. Aaron, BT Digger. Hi, 
asked about the, um, you know, the people being monitored and I told that um, the people on that website are people who have registered through Terra Alert. Um, now it's up to about 700 people being monitored, presumably most of which are the people on Terra Alert. Is that about what the state expected? And I was just wondering, just in general, um, you know, if you're, you're noticing a trend that people actually really coming into the state or going elsewhere and then coming back, um, increasing because of the new uh, rules about those visits and but that, you know, is showing you that. So thank you for the question. The, the precise number that I had earlier in the week was 779, uh, so close, close to 800. Uh, which you may have actually reached already, for all I know. Um, so Sarah Alert began as really our attempt to make sure that someone who was identified through contact tracing would have a uh, tool at their disposal that would allow them to easily monitor their own symptoms, really without even having to think about it. Um, and they can quickly connect through that tool with the health department and get any guidance they need. And likewise, the health department could provide guidance to them in general. That's been expanded to the pool of people who like contact trace people need to be quarantined. So they may be coming into the state from a hotter area and are under a quarantine uh, advisory. And they should have the same opportunity to be able to monitor symptoms, connect with the health department, get the education and information that they need in a readily available way. So the bottom line is that um, I'm not sure we knew what that number would be um, based on the number of people who may have returned to Vermont in March or April or May versus now, um, and how many are still returning to Vermont, how many are now traveling into Vermont as, as tourists or for other purposes. Um, I expect that number is going to increase and increase uh, until, as the governor puts it, the, the rest of the region looks like Vermont in terms of uh, active cases uh, per million people. All set, Aaron? Yep, that's it. Thanks. All right. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Getting back to the emergency funds for businesses, uh, you had tweeted this morning about 195 million getting out to businesses. That was what you were hoping for. And obviously, the legislature is more than 100 million short on that. They plan to go on recess in just a couple of weeks and not come back until August or September, I guess it is. There could be a lot of empty storefronts between now and then. Can you and would you consider? Uh, jumping over them and just uh, taking the CRF money and distributing yourself. Um, you know, as tempting as that might be, uh, no. Uh, I think we have to continue to work together uh, and uh, and work uh, towards trying to to. Um, I think there's still time to uh, for them to act. Uh, I believe. Uh, they're, they're going to be working until the end of the month. Uh, there are a number of provisions working their way uh, through the legislature at this time, and, uh, and it just takes them uh, to, to act upon that and to pass uh, more of the money through so that we can get them in the hands of those who need it. Um, I would say uh, that uh, part of um, some of my concern from last week uh, was uh, the, this somewhat hoarding of money uh, to keep uh, in hopes that the federal guidance would change so they could utilize that for our budget deficits, which I think is short-sighted, as I stated before. I just believe, fundamentally, we need to fix the, the fractured foundation, the economic foundation that we have right now that we can see. And these businesses who provide jobs uh, to a number, hundreds and thousands of Vermonters are at risk right now. I mean, we see 50,000 people on unemployment uh, right now. 
Uh, we need them to get back to work, uh, and we need uh, to make sure that we're protecting these businesses uh, so that they're ready and, and able when a lot of these restrictions are removed. So again, um, my concern is uh, we need to get the the three at least the three hundred million dollars uh, of the first phase of the package was three hundred ten million. Uh, the second phase of the package was ninety million. That could wait uh, until they get back if necessary. But really, the three hundred million uh, is needed right now. And I believe you probably heard uh, from as many people as I have about the need that's out there. Yeah, they keep asking me for some reason, Governor, so that's why I asked you. Thank you. Yeah. Guy Page. Governor, you said that your eventual decision to end the state of emergency will be data-driven. Can you provide more specific detail about what that data inside and outside Vermont would need to look like? And do you think the state of emergency will be over by Labor Day? Well, uh, first of all, I certainly hope the state of emergency is over by Labor Day. Uh, but I don't uh, control the virus, uh, and it, uh, it has a mind of its own. Uh, so we'll do the best we can. But if everything keeps moving in the direction we're seeing today, I have no reason to believe that the, the state of emergency wouldn't be over uh, by then. It's just a question of unwinding it in, in a safe manner uh, so that we get to a point where everything is open to some capacity and beyond, you know, almost back to normal. Now, there's going to be some holdovers, uh, I, I'm sure, that mass gatherings that we saw previously, like at fairs and so forth, probably won't be able to happen even then. Um, but will we get back to 100% retail? Will we get back to some something close uh, to 100% and and with the amount of distancing that we need uh, in some of the uh, bars and restaurants and hospitality uh, sector um, uh, initiatives? I hope so. Um, so. When we get to a point where most of the Northeast and most of the nation uh, gets, uh, Northeast in particular, and we see the border open back up. I mean, they just uh, decided, uh, I think, the last few days uh, that the border, the Canadian border would remain closed uh, So, uh, for another month. So we're into uh, uh, July 21st at that time. We'll know a lot more um, by, uh, by mid-July at the end of this state of emergency in, in regards to how long it's going to last uh, from there. But, but right now, it's all you know, somewhat good news. And uh, again, when we see uh, the Mass Massachusetts, uh, New York, New York City, and Boston in particular, and we see New Jersey and Connecticut uh, start to uh, get healthier, uh, then it gives me, uh, I guess, uh, some optimism uh, that we're going to be able to get through this uh, in, in the next couple of uh, the next couple of months. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I'm curious, you, you had mentioned the mass gatherings. Uh, anyone thought about maybe asking people attending these, these rallies to perhaps have their temperature taken, uh, give their names so that they, they can be traced if necessary? Uh, you know, sort of a precautionary, not, not saying no, but, but more precautionary measures. Yeah, I mean, it would be best uh, if we could know who they are in, in some respects, but I don't know who would do that, uh, to be honest with you, Guy. Uh, there's so many, uh, and again, uh, from what we've seen thus far, we haven't, uh, we haven't had anything linked back uh, to the protests, which tells us a couple of things, which is good news. Um, so what we'd ask them is to protect themselves and others, uh, make sure that you're wearing some facial covering, as well as trying to keep as distance as possible. Uh, don't, uh, don't congregate uh, for a long period of time and just be smart about this. Uh, exercising your, uh, your uh, constitutional right is important, but it's also important to protect others. So just keep you know, common sense in mind as you, as you uh, engage in, these, uh, in some of these uh, gatherings. Thank you. Courtney, Local 22. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Um, so just a kind of follow-up question. 
um, regarding group gatherings. We have a viewer that's concerned um, about a funeral service that they have been holding off. And they're wondering, you know, if, if this has been talked about to increase that size and specifically, they're wondering if 50 people would be allowed by July um, at a funeral service or services like that. At this point in time, um, if you have a, it depends on the size, if you have it in a church, let's say. Uh, if you have a, a gathering in a church, we've allowed for 25% uh, capacity inside a church. So depending on, on what's allowable uh, from a fire uh, safety standard, uh, they could have uh, maybe even more if you had a, a church that held, uh, let's say, you know, um, 500 people, um, then you could have 125 people there um, and, and space, uh, space apart. And, uh, and making sure that you uh, uh, protect yourself and others. But um, so I would say, again, we're trying to anticipate what's going to happen in the future. Uh, gatherings, uh, the size of gatherings is going to be a topic of discussion. Uh, and we have those on, almost on a daily basis. Uh, so hopefully we'll have some good news on that, uh, that front soon. But uh, in terms of funerals, if they're in churches, I would say uh, that you could have that, that service. Thank you. Ed, Newport Daily Express. I have no questions at this time, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Maria, Washington Post. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having this call. I appreciated that presentation on Friday and, and just wanted to follow up on um, the, the different metrics you're monitoring, Governor. I do wonder, I still, I'm not clear how bad it would have to get for you to um, stop kind of, um, you know, opening up the state or to kind of retreat. I mean, when you see an outbreak but in, by the numbers, it's kind of similar to your peak in early April, and of course we know a lot more now, your other numbers look good, but I'm just wondering what the, what your thinking is, you know, how, how, what would concern you, what would make you want to go, go back a little bit? Yeah. Uh, again, you know, we've come a long ways in terms of uh, the contact tracing uh, and testing and so forth, increase our capacity on both fronts. Uh, we're able to surround things better, uh, which is uh, great news for us. Uh, we've, we've learned a lot. Uh, so we could handle uh, more outbreaks simultaneously, uh, but if uh, for me uh, personally, and I rely on uh, Dr. Kelso, our epidemiologist, as well as Dr. Levine, our commissioner of health, to guide us uh, in when should we be concerned. My personal concern would be if we had um, so many uh, that we were uh, in a geographically dispersed uh, way uh, throughout Vermont and we weren't able to contact trace uh, and we weren't able to contain this uh, that would give me concern so uh, we're not uh, again we proved uh, in Winooski or at least uh, I believe we have uh, that uh, that we can handle uh, something of this magnitude and we'll continue to build on that success and and build our capacity at the same time Great, thank you very much. And, and just um, if there's anything, any updates on USCIS and, we'll, and the uh, furloughs, um, just put in a standing request for that information, please. Thank you. Will do. All right, thanks. All good. Thanks. Steve, NEK TV. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Um, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll work one for the doctor and then the governor, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, um, you said that uh, one has to be careful when one looks at data all the time. Um, do you worry that looking at, at, at all this data might like have a Heisenberg effect or, or might bias your, your decision making in any way? Yeah, I'll agree with what you said, I said that you have to be careful when you look at data. And my example of that is um, literally within a 48 hour period on the maps of disease activity in the country, we went from having the highest rate of increase in cases greater than 50% looking like the sky had fallen 
to that's a bright red color to a bright green color, meaning we were one of the only states that had a greater than 50% decrease in the number of cases and looked like the best picture possible. So depending on what day you look at that, you would come up with a conclusion that wouldn't be truly reflective of what the experiences here on the ground in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's reassuring to me, and it should be reassuring to everyone, is we're not continually inventing new types of data to look at or new ways of looking at the same data. We're being very consistent. So if we're consistent and we say that we have maybe a threshold of four or five percent in our percent positive tests, that's the way we're looking at it every day. And when we're down below two percent and even down below one percent like we have been recently, that would be a real change if it was suddenly five percent or ten percent. Um, so you know we're not we're looking at the same data and in the same way. Um, and that goes for pretty much everything that we're doing. Um, obviously, there are some things we may not have measured before, and now we have the opportunity to measure them or the ability to measure them, and we'll start looking at them in a methodical way too. But I think the word methodical is the key here. If you're methodical and you're consistent, um, you don't run into trouble. Um, it's only when you try to present perhaps a rosier picture of something than what the data really shows that you could run into trouble. Um, and there are plenty of examples of that uh, in the evening news, but not from here, hopefully. Uh, thank you.